All right, back at it. Another episode of the More To It podcast. I am the host, Jay Moore, with Hail Varsity Magazine and HailVarsity.com. I am pleased to be joined today by Mr. Rick Pizzo of the Big Ten Network. He is gracious enough to take some time off. And, uh, well, he's sitting around set. They have some uh, mechanical, some uh, sound issues. So he's uh, able to uh, squeeze me in today. Rick, thanks for thanks for uh, so much for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure, man. Just kind of biding our time here. Obviously, it's uh, it's a different summer for everybody, man. We're using the technology to do a bunch of stuff from home, but every now and then we come into studio, and uh, it's a summer like we've never had before, you know? I mean, like you, I spend most of my summers trying to play a lot of golf, but this summer, man, that has not been the case because we've been trying to follow the news. It changes, right? It changes every day. It changes every five minutes, it seems like, right now. Yeah, so what are let's let's get right into it. I know we could we could talk golf and and what and beer and food and our all day things all all day. Um, but I mean, the Big Ten Network kind of dropped the bombshell last week, and with the conference only schedule, other conferences are falling. What what are you guys have been discussing your guys' plans for the fall with that? If there's football at at the Big Ten Network at Big uh, BTN right now? Yeah, I mean we're planning on it. That's what the commissioner proposes and I, I think that's the biggest reason why they decided to get rid of the non-conference schedule it basically allows everybody even the teams that had some conference games early you get to push those back the people that are really smart and the mathematicians and the calendar builders they're working on all that scheduling stuff right now but it basically gives everybody an extra three weeks to kind of reset and right now having an extra three weeks to make a decision it's like a lifetime because mm-hmm. that's exactly what everybody needs right now and i think at the end of the day <clears throat> As much as we're going to miss Ohio State, Oregon, as much as we're going to miss Michigan, Washington, you can't lose the conference season at the cost of trying to play a couple of non-conference games, even the bigger ones. I think that's what the commissioner realized. So we're moving forward with the plan that we hope we see football when the exact start is going to be. We're not sure. I can't imagine it's going to be right at the start of when we expected. That's what those three weeks are built in for. But when they work that schedule out, that's when we'll then find out which TV partners get what games on what days they'll be scheduled. But I, I, I also think there's going to be a lot of flexibility, right? Who's going to be willing to play a power five school on a Thursday night, maybe mm-hmm. who's going to be willing to play at a non-traditional time on a Saturday. I think everything's kind of open. Yeah. Is, do you think you'll see, well, will BTN be on the road? Do you think you guys will, will go out and set up shop or do you think even, even to the extent of, um, I know you do, do a lot of sideline stuff. You know, yep. I've had Kevin Kugler on the show before, uh, just a few weeks ago. Maybe doing more remote stuff just to try to minimize travel and, you know, spread and every, whatever it might be. Um, have those discussions been in play with you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think that the discussions are certainly being had. They're, to be completely honest with you, my level is probably here. And those discussions are happening at, at levels, <laughs> sure. you know, sure. way up here. Um, but, but I think just like every network, I mean, to think that any network covering football or covering any sport this fall is going to travel to the extent it traveled in 2019, that, that's just not reality. You're not going to travel as many people. You're going to travel the fewest amount of people that you can. And I think more people will, re- will rely on that in-studio broadcast technology. Uh, we've been doing it for basically a decade here, almost since we started. And, and we started doing it with some of the non-revenue sports. But you start to evolve and the broadcasts that we can do, which are called at home productions without sending people on the road. There is a difference, sure, in the atmosphere that the reporter feels if he's not there or she's not there and the play by play and color guy. But the quality of the broadcast is the same. So if that's what we have to give back to make sure that we have football on television this fall, I'm most certainly willing to do that. And I I think ninety nine point nine percent of football fans are, too. Yeah, totally. So I was listening to Joel, uh, Joel Klatt was, you know, he was discussing with Urban Meyer and, and, and uh, Reggie Bush and a few other guys. And he brought up a really good scenario with college football. And he talked about buying more time, getting yourself more time. And he kind of proposed you have your 10 games, but maybe stretch out that season 18, 19 yeah. weeks to Christmas. Uh, that's that's a phenomenal idea. I, I know I don't know what bowl games are in play, conference championships are in play. I just, we can't even, I don't even know if we can go that far yet. We have to get to regular season play first. But to me, that seems like a pretty good idea. Do you think the Big Ten, Pac-12, SEC, ACC will will adapt to something along those lines? You know, it's interesting because there's that argument and then there's the other completely counter argument, which is don't even take a bye week. And if things are going well, try to pack it into 10 weeks. Why risk then going to four months? Because if a quarantine is really 14 days and you spread out 10 games over 18 to 19 weeks, 
how much are players going to miss if they have to be quarantined for 14 days? Does it really make that big a difference? Or do you just say things look pretty good in this geographic area, the middle of September? We think they can look good until the middle of November. Until something pops up, let's schedule back to back to back. There's not as much wear and tear with no non-con. You had a little bit more of a break during the summer. I think both options are going to be explored. But the interesting thing, Jay, you know, this decision is not going to be made just by the people that are in charge of football and the conferences. There are going to be medical advisors that are in there, you know, that are a big part of this right now saying, hey, listen, right now the better play is 10 weeks or the better play is 18 weeks. And you hope, you think, and you really hope that the commissioners and everybody that's making these decisions takes that medical advice and puts it into whatever decision they're making. I know Kevin Warren certainly will. Yeah, absolutely. When do you think, when do you think you're going to have the timeline just to kind of know this is what is going forth? Is it, is it August 1st? Is it, you know, next week? Is it a week from now? You know, when, when do you think you're going to have, cause you got to kind of put a plan in place. I mean, yes, technically, you know, Nebraska produced kicking off September 5th, potentially, right. you know, you have to have some sort of plan in place so everyone else can, you know, um, get their get their ducks in a row accordingly. Yeah, I think one of the big time frames is the six weeks because the six weeks was already approved for that to be the time frame of your late summer, early fall camp practice, right? You have a six week window before your first game. So we're approaching, if you're going to start talking about the beginning of September, you're approaching that six weeks right now. Now, this is nothing that I know from any inside info. This is just conjecture. I don't think that that opening date is the opening date that we end up seeing. I, I would be really surprised if it is just because while the big 10 and the PAC 12 have made the announcements that they're going to eliminate non-conference competition, we haven't heard anything officially from some of the other power five leagues. So they have to follow suit first. I think they will. And then the scheduling within the conferences then takes precedent and becomes the most important thing. So I think that's the date that you got to look at. It's these decisions have to be made with that six week window in mind to have that full six weeks of camp to make sure that the athletes are ready, that they're safe from a regular health and safety perspective before you even start talking about COVID-19, before you start actually envisioning what the start date is. Right. Football has to be played in the fall, right? Like it's just, I mean, I, I just can't imagine it being pushed to early winter, late spring especially for the Big Ten. I mean, yeah, Pac-12, ACC, SEC, that I could works there, but just weather-wise. But just doesn't seem right. I know you'd want to do everything you can to get football played, uh, but pushing it maybe to the spring, is just it just seems a little awkward. There's a lot of stuff that would have to happen, right, for the spring. So you have to make sure that the schedule is done in a way, assuming basketball plays, right. that one sport doesn't take everything away from the other. What are you going to do about bowl games or a college football playoff if you're going to start in January and go to April, that amount of time basically would put any type of bowl slash college football playoff scenario right around the final four, right around the end of March Madness. And trust me, that NCAA basketball doesn't want anything to do with that because if they miss their tournament in 2019 or 2020, they don't want to share any of that with any sport in 2021. And then you also run into, if you're going to go much later than that, what about the NFL draft? I yeah. mean, how much, how much do you risk if a really highly rated player who knows after the year that they had in three weeks, they're going to be picking the top five of the NFL draft. You tell me you're going to risk it. Even if it's a college football playoff semifinal, you're going to, you're going to guarantee yourself tens of millions of dollars. You might just walk away and say, I'm not going to play in this college football playoff semifinal. I don't think you would do that in December. So could it happen? Yes. I think there are just so many hurdles to make that happen successfully in the spring. Yeah, that'd be something. I mean, Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, you know. Exactly. They, they, Imagine they, Chase Young. If it was Chase yeah. Young this year, does Chase mm -hmm. Young want to play in the college football playoff semifinal? If he knows he's going to be the second or the third pick off the board, that's, a, that's an unfair decision to ask an athlete to make. Yeah, yeah, that NFL draft totally throws – I mean, it's just, it's just a weird timing, but the NFL draft throws a total wrench into it. Um, do you have a scenario now? I mean, I've done this podcast now for since March, and I've started out. I don't know if college football will be played. I did one just a few weeks ago. I'm like, I 100 percent it's going to be played. Now I'm yeah. now now I'm back down to, gosh, I just just more and more. Even we get more and more information, but it seems like sometimes we just don't get the correct information to really right. make a concrete decision. Is do you have a scenario where you think college football doesn't get played? 
I don't right now. If you're asking me, we actually were just having a discussion where we were waiting to tape our show with one of my co-anchors, Mike Hall, and he said, if you had to put a dollar down, how many games you think are going to be played? And I said, well, I think you have to go conference by conference because I don't think you can throw a blanket over the nation and say – we should expect the Pac-12 and the Big Ten and the SEC to play the same number of games. I'm just not sure that that's realistic. But when you start to see the numbers that are being released, you start to see these numbers that are being released by the schools, how much testing is happening and how many, and the better way to say it is how few positives are coming back for these student athletes. And you start to think about a conference-only competition where you're busing to almost every place. Okay. Yes, Ohio State last week stopped voluntary workouts for one week because there's some test results. But then after the following week's test results, they approved their athletes coming right back on the field. So if the Big Ten athletes, for the most part, are staying safe and the medical advisors say there is not an outside risk, then I'm just not sure why you wouldn't do it. Now, if the medical advisors can't say that they can promise a low amount of risk, then there are some very difficult decisions to be made by conference commissioners. And, and that's why I'm glad that I'm talking about the sports after they're played, <laughs> not being part of the decisions that have to be made to play them. Right. Yeah. It's gosh, there's just, there's so much. It's great. It's just wild. Cause we get, we're getting more and more information provided to us every day, but it seems right. like we still can't, we still can't get, you know, too light at the end of the tunnel or, you know, to make a more concrete decision. I guess this, that's kind of the world we live in nowadays. Um, how confident are you that all 14 Big Ten teams will play this year? I think if one do, I think if one does, all 14 do. I really mm -hmm. do. Um, I think that these schools have shown right now, all the testing that's coming back, all the results give us a positive sense. Now, I understand that's this geographic footprint. You know, I mean, Penn State just released, about, I think the final number was 178, no mm -hmm. positive tests. So if that's the case with multiple schools, then that, my friend, that is very good news. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're not too concerned with Rutgers. Well, I mean, you're concerned with you're concerned with every school that has decided that they're going to do remote learning for the most part sure. and maybe no on campus competition. And they did say you got to remember, though, right, that Rutgers and, and excuse the lighting here as I walk back to the uh, get ready for the taping here. But you got to remember that Rutgers did say the guidance for athletic events will be determined by the Big Ten Conference. They said no on-campus events, but they said that sporting events would be decided by the Big Ten Conference. So I think that's the language inside that release that you have to know. Yeah, very good point. Never need to do some, some better research on my part, but that's, thanks for bringing, bringing that one up. Um, fans, at, fans are seeing it. Illinois comes out and says 20%. Um, Nebraska hasn't really put a number on that yet. I know Ohio State's as as mentioned some you know the 30 percent wise fans have to be in the stadium to some extent just because that's college football right yeah yes and no does it change what college football is absolutely but jay if you tell me that my two options are to have maybe six weeks of college football and 30 percent of the fans get to go or every game gets to be played and we have a true conference champion and we maybe even have a true national champion but no fans can see it unless they're watching on TV. That's the option I take. Listen, I understand that there are season ticket holders and lifelong fans that have gone to every game for 50 years. I mean, I met some of them in Lincoln when I went. I mean, that fan base is just like that. But if it means that we can play college football, if the fans don't go, I know it is a tough, tough decision to make. But that's the decision that I would make. Yeah, yeah. I just I couldn't imagine. I mean, I could. If it's, let's just say I, I get get 30%, whatever it is, what it is. Um, that's better than nothing. But better just, than nothing. It would be wild. It's just got to be wild. I mean, to see Nebraska, to see Memorial Stadium or any, I mean, the Ohio State, the, the big house with 25,000 people in it. I mean, it's just. It's but I'd ask you this, would it be weirder with 25,000 or would it be weirder with nobody? I'm Zero. actually not sure. What, Zero. I'm, I'm right. I'm not sure what would be weirder. They'd both be really weird. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it's again be better than nothing. But yeah, it's just well, the the lengths we have to we have to go through here. Okay, I think we both now uh, could agree we're both kind of, we're being overly optimistic with uh, thinking that there will be football in the fall with the, with the Big Ten. Now, whether it starts early September, late September, early October, that's uh, that's yet to be seen. 
But once we do start to see play, how do you think quality of play will be in the Big Ten? Just with, you know, I'm hearing people maybe maybe going to the extent of not having um, 11 on 11, you know, practice in, 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 in training camp, a lot more individual stuff. Um, how that could potentially, you know, you're dealing with a starter might get, uh, may get sick during the season, just the quality of play, um, how that could be limited uh, once, once play starts in the fall. Yeah, I think the point you bring up about training camp and not being able to go 11 on 11. I mean, Kirk Ferentz talked on Thursday about how the fact that they're not even doing seven on sevens right now during voluntaries. And that's something that right now they would be doing a ton of. I don't think the elimination of non-conference is going to affect the quality that much. I really don't because I think there is such amazing prep by the coaches. I mean, they have it monitored out to the minute, right? I mean, yeah. they have these schedules and they know everything they have to get done. And now, by the way, you don't really have to worry about preparing for a week one or a week two opponent. Like a lot of these schools sometimes play the service academies and how hard that is to get ready for an army or a Navy in week one. And then you flip to a big 10 schedule in week two, or maybe you play them in three and then you flip to that schedule in four so those worries are gone. So I don't think it's the elimination of the non-con. I think it is how much you can do during training camp. I really do. If, if that six-week span is not able to accomplish what mm -hmm. coaches and staff would normally accomplish, that is, I think, early in the season where you see the fall off. Because that, maybe to the uneducated football fan, to those who don't know Every system that is basically installed in the spring is perfected in the fall. And now remember, there was no spring. So right. there was no installation there. So now you have both an installation and a perfection before getting into conference play. So I think that's going to be the key. Once you get that check mark and the OK to start that six weeks, are you full go? Are you doing 11 on 11s? Are you contact as much as the coaches want contact? Because... There's also the safety issue, Jay. I mean, I mean, you know, as a guy who likes to hit people, it's like you got to get into that. You, you have to do that during the course of that six weeks of that fall camp to make sure that you do it not just correctly to take down the opposing runner, but do it correctly to not hurt yourself. So I think those are the things that you have to be concerned about based on what you can and can't do during training camp. Yeah, this is my next question. This is putting the, the cart way before the horse here. Do you think there's any scenario where the Big Ten goes to 12 games? A uh, 12, I would be really surprised. I think that's asking an awful lot. Yeah. Now, I, I know that Gene Smith even touched on the possibility of going to 10. So you would basically add another game to the conference schedule. I think the interesting discussion there is, do you play a second division team? Do you play a division team twice? Does Nebraska play Iowa twice? Right. Or do you say, no, we don't want to do that because that's unfair based on who you're playing. So you have to play a crossover. And then the questions become, and I know there are tons of people trying to work all this stuff out. If you get that 10th game, can you guarantee that the team that right now is the 5-4 home away, that their 10th game against a crossover is an away game? So it's 5-5 five, five, because, you know, if they go to 10 games, but one team has to play six on the road and another team in their division gets to play six at home, there's going to be some grumbling about the unfair and the inequity in the conference schedule. So going to 12, I honestly, like in my heart of hearts, I think that's just too much to chew, too much to bite off in conference yeah. play. But I would love to see them go to 10. I would love to see that one extra game. Yeah, my only thought was just to try to recapture revenue. Yeah, you know, somehow, no, for sure. Because that's, I mean, we can all, like I've talked, we've talked endless about this now. I mean, it's the too big to fail type of deal. And then I, I can't remember, I, was, I think it was uh, an article in the New Jersey uh, newspaper talking about, you know, if there's no football, $950 million would be lost between all yep. 14 Big Ten schools. Yeah. And just, I mean, obviously it's going to be a huge economic impact without no fans, but it's just trying to figure out ways to recruit that, that money one way or another. Yeah, it's a massive amount of money, but I will say this. So let's say that's the scenario. Let's say they go to 10 games and let's say they're able to work out a way in which every conference team plays five home, five road. So even if you're a five home game school this year, and all three of your non-conference games are at home. And I, and I don't think very many Big Ten teams had that. So, so that would be eight. Your max amount of home games would be eight, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you go five. Now, obviously, we don't know the capacity that's going to be in those stadiums. But the capacity is going to be what the capacity is going to be. So 
if you lose three games, yes, that hurts on ticket sales. Yes, it hurts on concessions. Yes, it hurts on some other kind of revenue. But what it doesn't hurt on is the ability to get your full share of TV money. And that's where the money is right now. Yes, the concessions and the ticket sales are big. And I can't tell you the exact percentage, but it's nothing close to the 50 something million that these schools are getting as a school from the league with TV revenue and bowl money and everything tied in. If that went down to, say, 45 because you lose three home games, every school in the Big Ten can survive. Some wouldn't even really take that big a hit. The question becomes, what happens if it is not even five home games? What happens if it's not 10 conference games? And how many schools could absorb that big a financial hit? Yeah, yeah, it's very, very interesting. I mean, we still got to get there. There's a lot There's a lot of information that we still need and get the clearance. So um, let's, let's transition to a little bit of Nebraska. Ten-year anniversary for Nebraska being in the Big Ten this year. Crazy. Um, yeah, it's gone, it's gone fast. I remember I was with the Titans with, in Tennessee when this all came out. I'm like, whoa, this is – I liked it. I, I, I was a Big 12 guy personally. Love still being able to drive to Ames, drive to Lawrence, drive to Manhattan, Kansas. Um, you know, now you can, you're can you able to drive about Iowa City and, and Chicago, unless you want to, you know, that's in Minnesota. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're hopping on a plane to go to Minnesota. Yep. Uh, but the time spent, whether it's, whether it's football, basketball, um, kind of the first word that comes to me is underwhelming so far in the Big 10 for Nebraska. Would you agree? I think certainly when it comes to football, yeah. I mean, I think basketball kind of is where it is, sure. men's basketball. I mean, to be able to make the run to the NCAA tournament under Coach Miles was great, and I think Fred Hoiberg is the right hire. And I do think that you have to look at Pinnacle Bank Arena and realize that that's probably fueled in part by the Big Ten money that came along. So maybe you say basketball is is above that watermark. But for football, Jay, I mean, I, I, I have to agree with you. Like, I, I certainly thought that Nebraska would – win a Big Ten championship within the first 10 years. Um, I thought they'd be back in Indianapolis more often than they have been. Um, and I think it's not just the record, right? Because before Bo Pelini was let go, it was it was a nine-win team basically every year. And, and then you had a very strange hire and a hire that obviously just didn't work. Um, and now I think you have the right guy there. But... I think what really kind of sours some people is not just the losses, but the way that some of those games were lost. I mean, letting Melvin Gordon go for 408, getting 70 points scored on you, you know, in a Big Ten championship game. Um, all this buildup last year about the Ohio State game and just getting run off the field in the first quarter. It, I don't think it's just the wins and the losses. It's this amazing fan base that shows up each and every Saturday and wants to see a really good football game. And, and, and even in losses that I've seen at Memorial Stadium, if they're quality games, the team and the fans reflect that toward the other team. They say, great game, you played. But when you get beat by 50 or when you right. get the football run down your throat, that's a different story. And I think that's the bigger issue. I mean, for a team that was built for so long, right, on these nasty defensive guys that nobody could stop, these black shirts and these offensive linemen that just trucked people – to be out physical for basically the better part of a decade, I think that is what probably upsets the fan base as much as anything. And that is what is as surprising to me as anything. I think it's changing, but I think folks are ready for it to change yesterday, not tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, that all changed. That change came my time in Nebraska. Yeah. You know, Frank Solich is, goes 9-3 and three his last year. Um, we lose to a, a really good K-State team in 03. They ended up winning the Big 12 championship. We ended up winning – um, Alma Bowl that year against Michigan State. Uh, he gets fired. Bill Callen comes in. You completely change the whole, the whole mood of the of the of the team, the 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 mo, the main objective, the backbone of the team to West Coast. And yep. I lived it. And it's just crazy that people. I always I always joke with people. I have some people call it the the case of the four year flu around here with with the Bill Callahan scenario. And that was my time there. And it's just wild. I wish it could have been differently. But that's that all changed uh, that one day when they decided to fire. Frank Solitz after a 9-3 season. And, you know, there are other stories very similar to that. I mean, think about Michigan. Now, mm -hmm. Lloyd Carr retired. I understand that. Like, he was, you know, he was pretty much on his way out. But you end up going eventually to Rich Rodriguez, who basically did nothing that Michigan had done forever. And it's not just the lack of success, right, that a Callahan or a Mike Riley had. 
during the time that they're there. It's the fact that they're recruiting guys that are going to be there for the next three or four years. So even if you then have a coach to come in with the right system, you don't have the right players anymore. Mm-hmm. And so it is not just a three-year or a four-year flu. It becomes, unfortunately, and this is a term I probably shouldn't use right now, it becomes like a <laughs> 10-year pandemic, right? Right. <laughs> because it lasts way longer than it should. Right. And I think that's exactly what happened. It's impossible. It's impossible to play the kind of football that you want to play as a program if you don't have the players. And if the coach before you and the staff before you brought in players that do completely different things than you want to do, and, you know, I mean, Scott played for a national championship coach who based everything he did on physicality. And now he comes in and he wants to do that, and he looks around the room and he's probably shaking his head going, really? This, this, right now, this is what I have? And I think he knew it was going to take a couple of years, and I think it's going to take a couple of years. Um, I think he's on the right track. They're doing a great job recruiting, especially up front, which he said was absolutely going to be one of their focus points over the next couple of years. But it is going to take a while, man, to get that back. Yeah, he's got to be. I mean, coming here his first year, the, the first football game canceled with the weather. Right. Next year, they struggle next year. Now he's going into this. I mean, he just cannot get off to a good start here. And, and what I'm, you know, and this year, the offensive line is finally going to be the strength of this mm-hmm. offense this year for the football team. And it's like, God dang, we can get some games going here. This offense can finally get to going to where he needs it to go. Defensively, it will be a little behind just because of the D-line situation and losing three starters to guys who are going to play yep. um, or are going to be in training camps on for NFL teams this, this uh, in a few weeks. But it just he just can't – he can't get off to a good start here. It's got to be absolutely frust- – so frustrating. Yeah, it's got to be killing him. And, you know, I've said for a long time, and I'm, I just talked with Eric Chenander last year, and – you know, obviously every defensive coordinator wants their unit to be great, right? But I think those guys realize if offense runs the way that Scott thinks his offense can run, the defense doesn't have to be great for Nebraska to win 10 games in the West. The defense has to be good. The defense has to be better than average. The defense has to force a couple of turnovers and not give up these monstrous chunk plays. That's all they have to do because I think the offense is going to be there now, for me, honestly, I think one of the most fascinating stories if we play football this fall, and I was asked this before the spring even started, is the quarterback situation. Because, listen, a couple of years ago, right, I mean, he got his guy. Adrian was his guy. And Adrian had a great freshman year. And then last year, Scott made no secret about the fact that he was okay putting a lot of pressure on this guy, saying he could be one of the best that's ever played this position at this school. Think about that. I, I mean, when you're comp- – yep. you, know, you got Tommy Frazier and company. I mean, right. you got some really good quarterbacks. And now what I saw from McCaffrey last year, man, I, I think there's going to be a wicked battle. Like, it may be Adrian's to start, but I don't think the leash is going to be all that long because – I think McCaffrey can do pretty much everything that Adrian does too. And, and we saw that last year. So I think I agree with you, by the way, I think the offensive line is finally going to be a strength. And I think the defensive line is probably going to be the biggest question, but I think the most interesting storyline will be under center. Yeah. And going back in history, all the times that we've had really good quarterbacks, there's always been a phenomenal QB battle, whether it's yep. Tommy Frazier or Brooke Berenger. It's a great point. Um, you know, it's, uh, Scott really didn't have – I'm trying to think Scott had – Scott Frost, Frankie London. I think Scott struggled his first couple games of senior year. They brought Frankie in, and he and Frankie – it's just always – everyone's favorite quarterback is always the backup, you know. Um, and you just look at in, in history, and I think that's maybe what hurt Adrian a little bit last year because he didn't have competition. Yeah, he might have been dinged up, but that brings out the best. You can't yep. you can't take those few reps off of practice. You have to be point. You have to notice the, the small things and have be very, very detail-oriented. So I – I hope Luke pushes him. I hope Luke pushes him. I know they can run in a true freshman quarterback um, at Oklahoma. I can't – his name is – or excuse me, out of uh, Logan Smothers, Alabama, not Oklahoma. Excuse me. And I hope what, everything I'm hearing from him is going to be really good. So hopefully he gets pushed because that's only going to make him better and make this offense go. What I, I think Scott has told me multiple times, you know, I, I probably did five or six sideline games for Nebraska last year just the way that – the schedule with the TV assignments worked out. And so I got to talk to Scott over and over again. And one thing I absolutely love about him is asking every single guy for accountability, just because you're starting this week. That doesn't mean that you're the starter next week. I mean, he's not looking a year ahead. He's looking a week ahead. I mean, there is a weekly competition at every position and, you know, without naming names, I know there are some guys that were part of the program over the last couple of years that are not part of the program now that may have been talented that I don't think were good locker room fits for the program. And now I think once you get 
the right mentality inside that room with those 85 guys on Saturday, I think that mentality means almost as much, clearly not quite as much as talent, but it means almost as much because if you're all in it and if you all believe that you have to be at your best, otherwise this guy right behind me has taken my job to your point, that competition level, man, it makes everybody better. Yes, it does. It does. I, I got, I remember we brought two freshman defensive end in and he played as a true freshman. And I was, I had to be on point. You have to, yep. it just makes you better. You know, just what you'd want it. It's, it makes you comfortably uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, I like and, that. Uh, that's, that just makes it. Yeah. Uh, Got to get your comments. You know, Mr. Colin Coward comes out and says Nebraska is a C job and a seven win job. You no. mean? No. Yeah, he likes he likes to poke the bear. He knows what he's doing. He wants the clicks, right? Yeah, but that's it's. I mean, to say that's a C job is, is right. That's like saying that Indiana basketball, because they haven't been to the Final Four in a while, is a C basketball job. I mean, that, that's just not true. You look at it is not just about wins and losses over the past eight to ten years, right? It is about facilities. It is about the ability to recruit. I think one of our analysts, Jerry Denard, always says it right. If you are maximizing your resources at the place that you are, how should you place yourself within your division and within your conference? Tell me that there is a program in the West Division, especially in the Big Ten, which has resources that are so much better than Nebraska's in all those different ways, facilities, recruiting, history, uh, amount of money that you can pay coaches and staff. Tell me a program that's so far ahead of Nebraska that Nebraska can't beat them on any given year. There isn't one, okay? Right now, I would say in the Big Ten, right now in the Big Ten overall, Ohio State is head and shoulders above everybody because of what they have done historically, but also recently, and because they continue to upgrade their facilities and continue to upgrade their recruiting. But there's nobody in the West that is like that against Nebraska. So to be able to say that it's a C job or that it's a seven win job, that's ridiculous. To, to me, Nebraska at this point, once Scott gets all the guys that he wants in, if you are not winning eight games a year, I, I, I'm absolutely shocked. I think that will 100% happen because you get a minimum of two non-conference wins and you get into that conference slate and I, I just a C job to me, a seven win job. That that for me, that is a little bit of poking the bear and trying to get as many people doing exactly what we're doing right what now. We're doing it worked, yeah, right, yeah. No, I know he brought it up. I'm like, come on, I, I do like I like him. I like listening. To, he brings a lot of good points. I'm like, come on, Colin. Like, I know what you're doing. You know how rambunctious this fan base is, and you want us to overreact to it. Good job because it's working. Right. Because right? I mean, that's what we talk about here, 24 seven, is Nebraska football. And it worked. You got him and I all fired. You and I all fired up about it. Yeah, it's just it's just not a C job. I mean, do you want to say that over the past ten years it has been a wildly you use the term underwhelming, right? That it has been yeah. a disappointing program as far as success rate over the past ten years. You want to make that argument with me? Sure, I will absolutely listen. You want to tell me that it is a C job and that there are that means that there are probably what if there's a hundred and thirty ish FBS yeah. schools that you're telling me that there are 60 to 65 jobs in the country that are better than Nebraska? Better. Come on now. Come on. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm glad we got that. They got one aired out. And I, I feel better now that it was just, I had, I had to bring that one up just because I thought that was, that was, that was. Yeah, very, I think he's great. I, I think, listen, I think he's, I think yeah. he's got some yeah. great, great content. He's really well versed in a ton of different things, but you know what? It's like, we all have opinions and that one I disagree with. Yeah, I right. totally, totally agree. All right, well, let's get into my three and out segment. This is to where we kind of talk about food, beer, golf, um, Love fun it. stuff. Um, favorite spot to go out when you come to Lincoln to do a game? Oh, man. Um, well, I do love Lead Belly because, you know, I can post up I can post up right at the bar and uh, have whatever's on tap, and their food is always really, really spot on. But is it called the other door, the little speakeasy that's – yeah, the other room. Yeah, the other room. Yeah. Big fan yeah. of the other room. And uh, last time I was there, I went to the Indian joint that's just kind of right in that same area in Haymarket yeah, there, too. The oven. The oven. And then they have a little yeah. bar area downstairs. Yeah. That was pretty cool, yeah. too. So, I mean, there's so, many, yeah, really good. there's so many good spots, man. You know, I, I think that people that don't know much about Lincoln or don't know much about Nebraska, when Nebraska joined the Big Ten, they're like, well, 
that's a road trip that we might want to take one time to see Memorial Stadium. No, man, on a football weekend, they usually put us up at the courtyard right there in the middle of Haymarket, and you can walk right across, right under the underpass to the stadium, and you'd never have to leave the area. Man, if I could have that trip 10 times a year, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. There's so many good spots in Lincoln. All right, let's get a little golf. Uh, uh, favorite golf. This is so you were in a Mike. We had this discussion with my buddy who's going was going to Chicago this week. I go, Chicago might be the greatest area for golf. Oh, in, in, in America, like the Pioneer area in North Carolina, you get the courses in Arizona, you get the the Bay Area in in California. Florida has it, but Chicago might have the best quality golf courses top to bottom in, in the country. Uh, what is your favorite course you've been able to play so far in Chicago? Man, there are a couple. Uh, there's a course just north of me called Shore Acres in, in Lake Bluff, mm -hmm. which is uh, an unbelievable, I believe it's a Rainer design, and it is just an unbelievable old golf course by the lake. There's one just down the street uh, called Onwensia, which is like 100 years old, which is amazing. Beverly is just south of Chicago, and Beverly is one of those courses where tee to green is pretty good, and you leave that course, and if you didn't three or four putt five or six times, <laughs> you had yourself a pretty good day. I, I mean, there are so many great ones. Uh, North Shore, way back in the day, hosted a U.S. Open that's amazing. Conway Farms that from time yeah. to time rotates and hosts the BMW. All these courses I'm mentioning, by the way, are within about 20 minutes from where I'm sitting yeah. right now. So I mean, to your point, I mean, we are overwhelmed by really good golf courses. I mean, Ross, Rayner, I mean, some of the best designers and these timeless designs, right, that have been around forever mm -hmm. that don't have to be 7,300 and 7,400 yards to be really good and really challenging. Man, I am absolutely spoiled where I live with golf. Yeah, in Lake Forest, that one is really good. Have you played that yep. more before? I've played Exmoor before. They hosted a senior event there last year. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. buddies with a member out there who played basketball at Indiana in the 70s with Isaiah, uh, early 80s, late 70s with Isaiah. And he brought me out there. And, um, you know, it's a pretty hard golf course. And then the seniors went out there and somebody shot like 22 under. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just ridiculous. Yes. It shows you how good those guys are. Have you played? So have you played Butler National? That's one that I have not played that I have to check off the list. But the guys that I have uh, talked to about playing it say it may be the hardest golf course they've ever played in their life. So if so, next time I'm in Chicago, there might be a good chance I'm coming there next next month for my birthday. So my good friend is now the head of golf at Butler National. Ooh, that's a good connection. So, so if I'm in town, I'll be sure to reach out and we'll go play. Yeah, well, I'll be sure to be available that day. I can tell you that much. How far is uh, you, you get up to Three Floyd Brewery, much uh, up in Munster? In Munster, yeah. Indiana, you, you know I don't make that trip that much because we have so yeah. many we have so many good ones here within literally again yeah. within thirty to forty five minutes. I and mean, we've got some unbelievable ones. Your Revolution has a massive brew house uh, down in Chicago, but I, I kind of like some of the smaller um, craft brewery places that are in Chicago. I mean, the, even the Northern Burbs has a, has a million of them, hot butcher and microphone and, and energy city and all these small little breweries that make unbelievable beer. I mean, like legit good. I'm a new England IPA guy, at least oh, that's yeah. the phase phase I'm going yeah. through right now. And it's Me such too. a, it's such a popular, you know, style right now that you find these craft breweries that are Hubbard's Cave and Niles is amazing, and they're just trying to pump them out. They can't even they can't even pump out enough New England IPAs. The the the, the doubles, the dry hop, they, they mm -hmm. just can't they mm -hmm. can't keep them in stock. Yeah, it's amazing how I many craft beers have popped up, and they're all good yeah. too. They're all good. Just, now uh, I I could go for a price point being a little lower. We're we're starting to get yes. to like we're starting to get yeah. to like a in the Chicago area like a four pack of sixteen ounce cans are, are creeping up on twenty bucks. Like that's yeah. I mean, back in college, 20 bucks, 20 bucks yeah. gets you like three cases of beer, man. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. Well, Keystone Light was like $10 That's for a 30 pack. The 30, the old 30 pack. That's right. All right. Last question for the three now. So you have one band, one concert you go to this band or, con or singer or artist can be dead or alive. Who's that one concert you're going to? Led Zeppelin. If it's dead or alive. Uh -huh. 
Um, you know, my, that's, I, I'm a, I'm a hard rock guy. And, and these days I listen to a lot, you know, more of the hard alt rock stuff, but I was brought up on rock by my dad and my dad was born in 1950. So he's, you know, a, a flower child, children of the late sixties, early seventies. And as soon as I was four or five, that's what we were listening to every day, you know, in the car or at the house, we were on the eight tracks, you know, we were listening to Led Zeppelin and, um, that's, I mean, if I could go back and watch all those guys together, the original lineup playing, especially if you could go overseas Ooh, and watch them in, in London, I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, everybody together, I mean, that, that band was just absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it's, you know, current bands, I mean, everybody likes to say Pearl Jam, who I think, you know, puts on a great show. Um, I would also th throw GNR in there because I think Guns N' Roses, when they were at their best, was as good a rock and roll band as there's ever been. Yeah. But if I had to pick one, if I had to pick one, it'd be Led Zeppelin. Can you pick a song your favorite? A Led Zeppelin song that's my favorite? Yeah. yeah. Um, probably the Immigrant song. I mean, I think the beginning of the Immigrant song okay. is just one of those where you hear it and you're just like, Yes, that is quintessential Led Zeppelin, this heavy, you got both the bass and the lead guitars, and then you got, you know, Plant just kind of screaming off the top before he gets into any type of lyrical stuff, some sick drums in the middle. Um, you know, and the funny thing is, I took my son, he's 13, we went to go see one of the Marvel movies, Thor Ragnarok, and the very uh -huh. opening scene, they have a little bit of opening scene, and then it dips to the opening credits, and this music starts blasting out. He looks at me, he's like, Dad, this is awesome. It was the immigrant song. I'm like, dude, this is like, this, <laughs> you call me old all the time. I'm like, this song is almost right. as old as I am, and you're absolutely loving it. So talk to me in 40 years, and you tell me if the stuff you listen to right now is still being considered as good as what we're listening to in the movie theater. Well, my intro music to the my cast book. So nice. Big Zeppelin fan. That, that one. That's a tough one. That that's my favorite and over the hills and far away. Like, yeah, also a great one. one. Just All, uh, also a good. great one. Rick, can't thank you enough for taking the time, my man. Thank you. I know you're you're a busy guy. Um, just moving to the house. I see you have paint on your fingers. You're busy painting today. All, so all over, man. I've been yeah, I've been painting right. the daughter's room. Uh, I, I much appreciate, my man, and uh, I can't wait to see your face on TV again when we're talking about live sports. My pleasure, man. This was a ton of fun. I hope we get to uh, tee it up sometime soon.